Please stand if you're able for the reading of God's word. Today we'll be reading from Mark chapter 10, verses 17, 17 through 22. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. May God bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. Thank you, Brian. Well, I love the weather. Do you guys love the weather? Why not? Josiah does, see? And this is precisely why I love the weather, because uh, I take walks during this weather. I took like five walks yesterday, and I remember walking to school in northern Illinois on the Mississippi River, where it's colder than this in the winter, and uh, walking for miles every day, three miles to school, starting at Josiah's age, at age five. It wasn't three miles then, it was one then, it became three later. But the thing is that as we adjust to things, God develops us in them. You know, that, that goes for weather, but it also goes for other things in life. Even hard weather is not all bad. And even circumstances that we find ourselves in which are difficult are not all bad. Today we have uh, quite a famous story, don't we? It's known as the rich young ruler, a provocative title. Uh, I, I think probably a more useful title in English would be something like the rich young man or even the wealthy young man, or the wealthy young person. I think by throwing that word ruler in, it's possible that some of us disconnect from the story. This somehow applies to this rich young ruler and not to the rest of us or to other young people. In fact, expositors and commentators are quick to point out that it does not apply to everyone, this story, that all Christians are not required to give up all their worldly possessions to follow Jesus. They are correct. However, the implications of the story are broader than most people imagine. While every Christian is not required to give up all their worldly possessions, all Christians are required to give up anything that would capture their heart, whether that be money, fame, power, status, cultural norms, and even family. For Jesus also says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That's Matthew 10. Indeed, we are not allowed to put anything ahead of Jesus, anything ahead of God, whether that be money, fame, power, status, cultural norms, history, or even family. This corresponds to the first commandment in the Decalogue, you shall have no God's before me. We cannot place anything in our hearts before the Lord. Now, this is just a sidebar. Most people in this room are pretty rich. Some of you are going, well, I don't know. I mean, 
I don't, I don't feel that way when I go to the grocery store right now. And I don't feel that way with inflation and these kinds of things. Uh, by the way, Loudoun County is the richest county in the United States by median income. Fairfax County is about seventh. This may, may surprise you to hear, but Prince William County is 17th or 18th in the United States. Now, there's about 3,500 counties in the United States. That means in terms of income, Prince William County is top 2%. Okay, I've lived a lot of places. I'm not going to go through them all with you. I assure you that Prince William County is much, much wealthier than where I grew up. I just told you, I walked to school starting at Josiah's age. We had no buses in our system. And it didn't matter how far you needed to walk, you needed to get there. So the reality is, you can still buy a house out there where I grew up for $80,000 right now. So the reality is a pretty decent one, a safe one, right? So the reality is we're all pretty wealthy, most of us. There may be a few who are not. I'm not taking away anything away from anybody. But we're all pretty wealthy. We're all pretty wealthy. And I think that every single one of us with a decent income here could fit into this story. Per the story of the rich young ruler, it is clear that we cannot place anything in our hearts before the Lord, including money and worldly possessions. Note well that the rich young ruler is invited into a relationship, a discipleship relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the crux of this story. It's not often mentioned, but what's actually going on here is that the Lord Jesus Christ is evaluating the rich young ruler and inviting him into a discipleship relationship. Yet, the rich young ruler, the rich young man, the wealthy young man, how about this, the affluent young man, yet the affluent young man cannot respond affirmatively because of his attachments to possessions and wealth. This, too, is the story of our day in America now. Whether you're upper class, middle class, lower middle class, or lower class, almost all Americans are consumed with thoughts about wealth and money. On a day-to-day -day level, it takes up most of our mental space. You ask somebody, what does Matthew 10 say in the church? I don't know. You ask somebody what the price of gas is, they know. They know. Many people go to church, so many people go to big churches and to small churches and to medium-sized churches, yet they never become disciples of Christ because of their preoccupation with money and worldly possessions. Notice the sequence of events in Mark. First, Christ talks to his disciples about marriage. We talked about that two weeks ago. Then Christ talks about children. We talked about that last week. Then Christ talks with the young person, the young adult. Marriage, children, young adult. That's the sequence of the last three scenes that we're studying. Notice that it's in this place, at this age, a young adult, that most people make their decisions about how to spend their life. Whether they will follow Christ or money, Christ or possessions, Christ or something else. With shocking clarity, God orders events and scripture catalogs it. Young adults very often decide their path, whether they will follow Jesus or something else, even when they have been raised in the faith 
as this rich young ruler has. He has kept the commandments since his youth. Don't miss that in the passage. He has kept his commandments. I'm sorry, he's kept the commandments since his youth. Now then, I ask you to think with me today and to reflect, to prayerfully reflect on what the Scripture is moving us to think spiritually. Let's do so with reliance upon God. Let's pray. Lord, uh, it's easy to look at this passage as sort of a shocking truth for life and not even really begin to think about what it means in our own lives day to day. Will we put you first? Will we put your teaching first? Will we put discipleship with you first? Or will we put worldly attachments, worldly possessions, and worldly goods first? No disciple can serve money, not your disciple, because you say elsewhere that you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. We all must decide that you are the first love of our heart. Lord, help us as we go through the passage today to see what you have in store for our lives, um, how we can change, um, how we can affirm others, how we can care for others, how we can do things in love, but also how we can turn from things that are wrong in our lives, how we can confess and repent things that are wrong in our lives. Please help us to learn, Lord. Lord, we ask you to teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we have three points today. Point one, approaching Jesus. Point one, approaching Jesus. Point two, hearing Jesus. Point two, hearing Jesus. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Point two, hearing Jesus. And point three, choosing Jesus. Point three, choosing Jesus. And our title today, Choose Wisely, Choose Jesus. Choose wisely, choose Jesus. Uh, These are within the context, as I said before, of a potential discipleship relationship and eternal life, as the text makes clear. These points, approaching Jesus, hearing Jesus, and choosing Jesus, are within the context of a potential discipleship relationship and eternal life, as the text makes clear. Now, my Reformed brothers, of whom I I am one, may not like my emphasis on the word choose here, but it is appropriate to this text, for the rich young ruler chooses worldly possessions over Jesus. And Jesus then says to his disciples how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. A somber warning to all of us, and in fact, to most American Christians. Point one, approaching Jesus. Please read verse 17 with me. As he was setting out on his journey, a man, you might want to underline that there, a man, it doesn't say a boy, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? First of all, I like it. I like it. The rich young ruler, I guess I'll keep calling him that for ease, the rich young ruler is bold. He takes the bull by the horns. He knelt down before the Lord and asked the most important question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? To inherit eternal life. Notice the phraseology. This is an educated young man. His question precludes works. He asks what I must do to inherit eternal life. His heart is primed and ready to take the right steps. And this is the point at which he comes into contact with our Lord and Savior. Some commentators like to pigeonhole this young man 
He's proud, he's rash, he's too bold, like an Ivy League graduate going for a job interview. They miss three important words in our scripture, in our passage. Jesus loved him. Our verses later say Jesus loved him. Jesus is satisfied enough with his approach and his lifestyle. Though he may be proud, he has humbled himself at the feet of Jesus and asked the all-important question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? When the prostitute comes to purity, that is the fullest grace and faith. When the proud young man comes to humility, that is the fullest grace and faith. Jesus loved him. He accepted his approach. What of your approach to Jesus? Has humility replaced pride? This rich young man approached well enough by the grace of God. This story is recorded in Scripture. Jesus accepted it, but he did challenge the young man about calling him good. The young man did not know that Jesus was God the Son. He calls Jesus teacher, so his faith was misplaced, and Jesus corrects the young man's faith not his identity. Uh, I can remember as uh, a young man, uh, I I spent a year traveling. I went through a lot of third world countries. And I can remember as a young man um, seeing a minister in an Asian country bow down to another man. I mean, like, the full, the full tilt. I mean, I'm not talking about, like, like this. I'm talking about like this. They didn't know I saw them. I was about 100 yards away, and it was just the two of them alone. So this wasn't for show. This man was one of the ministers of the country. When he bowed down that way to the other man, I thought, who is this man? That he's bowing down to. I thought, who is this man? We don't know sometimes who we encounter. But the rich young man was wise enough to have a sense of who Jesus is. He didn't get it perfectly. He didn't know it was God the Son. But he bowed down all the way and asked Jesus to give him a course and direction for life. Well, Jesus knew that the rich young man did not know who he was, so he corrected him. This again becomes a question for us. When you approach Jesus, do you know who he is? God the Son, second person of the Trinity, co-creator, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, all-powerful, all-knowing God. Um. We have such a strong sense of equality in the United States that, that it's hard for us to relate to Jesus. Yeah, Jesus says, I call you friends. He says that to his disciples, the apostles, after they've discipled with him for many years. He doesn't say at the beginning, I call you friends, right? Right? All right, but, you know, Marvin and I are equal, and Mike and I are equal, and Lavinia and I are equal, and Jeff and I are equal. We're, we're all equal. We're equal in the eyes of the law as citizens. But more than that, as brothers and sisters, we're of equal value to God. All of us, men, women, children, grandparents, all of us, Right? And Jesus does have a personal relationship with us. But we also have to remember who Jesus Christ is. God the Son, second person of the Trinity, co-creator, almighty God, all-powerful, all-knowing. When we approach Jesus, do we approach him in his true identity as Lord, 
Or do we get part of the way there the way this young man does? We tend to familiarize Christ. And to friends, this is acceptable. Yet this is God the Son, the one to whom we owe absolute obedience and in whom all of our trust and faith is placed. Good teacher, yes, Christ is that and more. Understand who he is when you approach him. Even recognizing his great humility. He had the humility to correct this young man by saying, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. A stunning statement from God the Son. A perfect correction. Jesus is God. God the Son. Jesus was calling the rich young man and us to truly recognize that he is God and that by grace we approach him in this way. He is not merely teacher, he is teacher and Lord. So that was point one, approaching Jesus. And a lot of it, as you could see, had to do with the identity of Jesus. Who Jesus is, is the basis on which we approach him. And then secondarily, who we are, his children, right? God's children, brothers. Hearing Jesus... Now, point two, hearing Jesus. Please read verses 18 and 19 with me. Hearing Jesus. Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and father. Verse 19 is an exceptionally clear verse. Jesus sets the law before the rich young man. He sets the part of the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments that have to do with man before him. This immediately makes me think of what St. Paul said. The law is a tutor until we come to faith. Some expositors And commentators like to go into rich speculation about these verses and what Jesus was doing. I'm sorry, I think it's a whole lot simpler than that. Jesus told this young man that to inherit eternal life, you keep the law. Of course, we know that no one can perfectly keep the law. This young man says, so Jesus just gave him the standard answer. It was just a general answer. He's this guy who pops up at this stage. It's a general answer. He might have said it to others who would approach him in a similar way. But this young man says, I did it. All of these I've kept since my youth. Well, we know that No one can keep the law perfectly, no, not one, except Jesus himself. But the law is still a tutor till we come to faith. And so Jesus says later in the passage, sell all that you have and follow me. Following Jesus is faith. Sell all that you have and follow me, from law to faith. So how are we to hear Jesus? We must hear Jesus if we are to be his disciples. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus teaches us. I propose here that Jesus moved from the general to the particular. Have you kept the law? Yes, that's general. Will you follow me? That's the particular. Hearing Jesus involves more than obedience. Obedience is very important, but following Jesus involves more. It involves love. Whoever does not love me more than father and mother is not worthy of me, says Jesus. It does not say, whoever does not obey me more than father and mother is not worthy of me, although we do obey Jesus. My point is this. Obedience connects to the law as love connects to grace and faith. The Lord Jesus Christ is bringing this young man out of the perceptibly gloomy chambers of law into the light-filled rooms of grace and faith. You have kept the law since your youth, since your bar mitzvah. That's what the young man saying. Good enough, says Jesus. One thing still you lack. 
give up all your attachments, of all your other attachments of heart. Give up all your attachments of heart and follow me. Live by grace and faith. Um, there was also a time, you, you know, if I tell you guys some of these stories, you just think, this guy's weird. But uh, there was also a time when I was around 20 that I started to give all my money away. I mean, really. i just, like, walk up to somebody and give them 200 bucks. I didn't have that much money, but I started giving it away. I'd see someone at the airport, and I'd give them all my money. i see a poor man, and I'd give him all my money. I thought after doing this for a while, mind you now, I knew Jesus' teaching then, but I was not a Christian, and I wasn't following Jesus' as Lord then. I thought after doing this several times, I thought to myself, if I keep doing this, I will die. That's literally what I thought. If I keep doing this, I'm going to die. I had to think about that. And I stopped doing it. I was half right. I meant, I thought to myself, I'll die physically. I was half right. If you live this way, giving away all that you have, you will die to self. That's the point. If you live this way, you will die to self. That's what Jesus was teaching the rich young man. That's the point of the passage that eludes so many. No one can live this way, I thought. There's a sense in which this is right. But man does not live on bread alone. It is at this moment that the grace of God fully kicks in. It can be at this moment that you live on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Only, only by following Christ can you give up everything you have. And only by giving up everything you have, at least in your heart, can you truly follow Christ. Let me repeat that because it's a, it works both ways. I don't, I don't want you to miss it. Only by following Christ can you truly give up everything you have. And only by giving up everything you have, at least in your heart, can you truly follow Christ. I may have jumped the gun, but I ask you to hear Christ. Christ speaks to us through his word. He speaks that we die to self and live in him. That's what he was telling the rich young man. The rich young man had all of these things attached to his heart. All of these possessions. Just put it in your own terms. Right? I've got a car attached to my heart. I've got the car that I drive in every day for the last 10 years. I've got a house attached to my heart. I've got the house that I lived in for the last 20 years. I've got the job attached to my heart. I've got uh, different things I like to do, activities attached to my heart. I've got the hobbies attached to my heart. I've got the NFL attached to my heart. That was something I had to rip off my heart, right? I've got all this stuff attached to my heart. We die to all of that and live to Christ. Sometimes it takes drastic measures. For this young man, it did. Jesus cut to the heart of the matter. For you to leave these attachments, you're going to have to give away everything that you have and follow me. Point three, choosing Christ. So that was, that was uh, point two, hearing Jesus. This is point three, choosing Jesus. Choosing Jesus. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I've kept from my youth since my bar mitzvah. By the way, just a sidebar. When a Jewish person, it can be a boy or a girl, 
around age 13. I've been to many bar mitzvahs. When a Jewish person, they have to learn Hebrew and recite it and all kinds of things. And that's always nice for me to hear somebody else speaking Hebrew at kind of the level I do. Um, but but when, when they're 13 and they're bar mitzvahed, they are then responsible as a person, as a quote-unquote adult, to keep the law. So Josiah, Josiah is what now, seven? Good guess. Josiah, if he was a Jewish child and he sinned, he's not yet responsible as a person for keeping the law. If he breaks the law, that's not going to be sort of held against him. But once he's bar mitzvahed, once he reaches that age of 13, once he makes that step of commitment, then he is responsible. That's what this young man is saying. He's saying, teacher, I have kept the law from my youth. I have kept it since I've been responsible for it. I've kept it since I reached age 13 or since I was bar mitzvahed. He said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened or discouraged by the saying, he went away sorrowful because he had lots of possessions. Jesus loves this young man and accepts him. Listen to me carefully. Jesus loves this young man and accepts him. That's why he says, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and follow me. It is a call to discipleship. It's not a penalty. It's a call to life. It's a call to discipleship. We all think to ourselves, this would be so crazy and horrible if this happened to me. If you think that way, it's because you have a heart attachment to money. American Christians often think of this story as, as a penalty, as a, almost a penalty verse. I, I'm t- I really, over the years, and this may be part of the way, way I'm approaching this this way, over the years, I, I've, read, I've read so many commentators make excuses for these verses saying over and over again, they don't apply to you. This was just to this specific young man. The more you think that way, the more you need these verses. We think this way because we're so materialistic, and so we we can botch the meaning. It's certainly a blessing to many Catholic clergy that they take a vow of poverty. This isn't works. This is disentanglement. Hear Christ clearly. You must choose Christ or choose the world. There's only two choices for how you live your life. You either choose Christ or you choose the world. You either choose the Spirit to walk in the Spirit or you walk in the flesh. You either choose the kingdom of God or you choose the kingdoms of this world. When we say somebody is a, is a, a worldly person, we're saying they're choosing this world. They're choosing the values of this world. They're choosing money and power and status. There is no in-between. You must choose Christ or choose the world. There's no 50-50. It's not both and, it is either or. This is not to be, there is not to be bifurcation in the Christian soul. Shalom. We want our soul to be whole. There is not bifurcation in the Christian soul, 
But there must be clear bifurcation between a Christian and worldliness. We are saved by grace, not by works, that is for sure. Yet parting with attachment to money and things is an important, even an essential step towards discipleship for many, many people. For many, many people. Again, even if you probably just read the the bottom of your commentary Bible that you have, if you have one, it might say down there something like, a Christian doesn't have to be poor. That's what we see in these verses, that it's not a universal principle. While strictly speaking this is true, I believe focusing on this misses the mark. Look down at Mark 10 with me. Let's read 23 through 26. We're not going to cover them today. We'll cover them next week. But just, just to make the point. So after the encounter with the young man, then Jesus then instructs his close disciples. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to to them again, you know, just like we're amazed, just like these commentators are amazed. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? True, we are saved by grace. True, salvation is of the Lord. True, with God all things are possible. Yet what is being pointed out in our verses today is that a heart attachment to wealth, material possessions, and an abundance of things is a serious, very serious obstacle to kingdom life, discipleship, and even the true repentance which is tied to salvation. Repentance from sin, repentance from worldliness, repentance from self, turning to God, including in actions, turning to Christ. Humor me a little, will you? Turn to Luke 12, verse 15, please. How are we doing on time? We doing okay? Let me... Let me check. Oh, well, we don't have much further to go. Let's read 15 through 23. Uh, If you want to read on your own time later through 31, that'll bring in the picture more, but we'll do 15 through 23. And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body body more than clothing. You see, life and kingdom life does have a sharp divergence from an emphasis on attachment to material possessions. Let me repeat that. Life and kingdom life does have a sharp divergence from an emphasis on and attachment to material possessions. You can see that just from these verses. 
From a focus on material possessions, seek ye first the kingdom of God. In fact, in our story of the rich young ruler, the rich young ruler does not turn away from possession and turn towards Christ. Rather, he chooses material possessions over Christ. He chooses wrong. He chooses wrong. Choosing Christ is not simply saying, I choose Christ. Choosing Christ, choosing the Lord, means choosing him above all other things, whether they be money, fame, power, status, cultural norms, history, or even family. Truly choosing Christ means committing to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and others as yourself. Truly choosing Christ means dying to yourself and taking up your cross. We believers, I believe most people in this room are believers. I have no doubt of that whatsoever. I'm not the kind of pastor who looks out at the sanctuary and thinks, oh, maybe half of these people are saved. I've heard pastors say that. I look out at the sanctuary, and I believe most people in the sanctuary, by God's grace, are saved. We believers have truly chosen Christ, lest we walk away sad like the rich young ruler. By God's grace, it has been made simple for us to choose Christ, for he died for our sins and rose, and we who believe into him Rise to new life with him. Let's pray. Lord, I feel sorry for this rich young man for multiple reasons. Most importantly, because as far as we can tell from the scripture, that he walked away from Christ. He walked away from life. He walked away from discipleship because he just couldn't part company with his things. He had to choose which he would love, Christ or stuff. He chose stuff. So I feel sorry for him in that way, Lord. I also feel sorry for him that that he had such a drastic encounter, although it was your providence, sort of a very high-stakes encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, where, for all we know, had this young man followed Christ, he he may, he, may have, he may have become an apostle or something like that. We don't know. I mean, no one can say. Of course, God knows. God does things according to his will. But he was invited into a profound discipleship relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, it's the same for us. It's the same for us Today, it's the same for us in our lives. We are invited into a discipleship relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's necessary for us to give up the other things our heart may be attached to, to truly walk with him. So Lord, I pray that this sinks in to hearts here and that there may be someone here today or tomorrow or next week that turns away from things and turns towards Christ and begins, begins at the type of walk with Jesus where Jesus shapes and forms our lives. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for this story, Lord. Thank you that um, it, it paints such a clear picture of who we are to be and how we are to walk with Jesus in the kingdom. Thank you for these things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.